Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Chris Maxwell who lives in Calgary, Alberta. Chris is an avid mountain hunter and has harvested his stone, his doll, and his rocky uh, mountain bighorn and uh, still is after the desert. Uh, Chris is a member of the Canadian Sheep Foundation and is just an avid sheep nut. Uh, And we're going to be doing a podcast today on going guided. And Chris has a whole extensive outline and has really thought this over on going guided. And I thought this would be a good episode for the listeners out there that maybe haven't been on many guided hunts or thinking about going on a guided hunt. Um, So we're going to kind of dive into the weeds on this one. Chris, how are you doing? Good. Yourself, Jay? Oh, doing just fine. Uh, If you would... uh, uh, give a little um, background on yourself and your love for mountain hunting and, you know, where that's led, you know, different places that's led you to and, and the adventure of, of mountain hunting. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I actually grew up in Saskatchewan, which is basically um, just known for, you know, big whitetail hunting. Basic is what everyone thinks of when they think of Saskatchewan. It's total prairie, no mountain animals whatsoever. Um, but, uh, after I graduated from uh, university, I moved to Alberta to work in the oil field. And, uh, of course we got over the counter bighorn sheep tags here, um, and all kinds of mountain hunting. And, uh, after the first uh, trip I went on uh, with a a friend of mine, I was absolutely hooked from day one, um, just the whole challenge of it. And, you know, it, there was no guarantees you're going to get something that was actually quite difficult especially for someone new to it that didn't have a whole lot of experience and um you know as i uh got more into the sheep hunting i eventually uh joined the board of directors on the alberta wild sheep foundation and still on it today and uh yeah i try to attend a lot of conventions and talk to fellow sheep hunters and there's a lot of um pretty prolific uh sheep hunters within the wild sheep foundation and uh, some of these other uh hunting organizations so it's been a really good opportunity for me to connect with uh, like-minded people yeah for sure and um so uh you have harvested your stone sheep and your rocky and your doll um out of those three what would you say which one of those was your hardest um so uh, I'm going to say the doll was by far the hardest, and it wasn't the hardest because the mountain was the worst or whatnot. It was the hardest because um, it was a 21-day backpack hunt. Um, we had nothing but mountain house teeth the entire time, and I never harvested my ram till day 17. So um, the day I actually got my sheep, um, you know, we were so out of energy, and we had to climb this well, it wasn't even that bad of a mountain to pop over the top to get on top of them. And, you know, it felt like we had climbed Everest by the time we got to the top just because we had no energy and we're essentially starving to death on Mountain House after 17 days. But uh, we got it done, and the pack out was the, <laughs> probably the worst one I've ever experienced just because, like I said, we have no energy left. And and um, But it was an adventure. So was, that was, was that your first of, of sheep? Yeah, it was actually the first sheep I actually harvested. I, I had um, hunted uh, on my own for uh, bighorns in my home province of Alberta for a few years before I went to Alaska, and uh, I had never pulled the trigger on a bighorn. I had a chance to take a couple of rams, but they were young, and um, I just don't want to shoot a young ram. I'd prefer at least an eight-year-plus-year-old uh, sheep, regardless if it's legal or not, so... Um, that was actually the first uh, hunt I, sheep hunt I'd been on that I actually uh, was successful on. How did your feet hold up after that 17 days? Um, actually, uh, so prior to that trip, I'd never had a proper pair of uh, hiking boots. And um, about four months before that trip, I bought a pair of hand wags. And, you know, there's a lot of high-end boots out there, but that hand wag, just fit my foot perfectly and you know through the water up and down you know and my feet never were wet once and I never had a single blister that entire trip and uh, I actually still had that was in 2012 we did that trip 
and I'm still using the same pair of boots today. I just, you know, treat it, what, what, like wipe them down, treat them with uh, waterproofing and all the rest of it. And I've used that uh, pair of boots, I want to say, on over a dozen sheep hunts. And I've yet to have a blister and my favorite pair of boots by far. But, uh, you know, there's all kinds of brands of boots out there. But I would say, you know, pick a good pair of boots, uh, like one of the better quality boots, and but pick the one that fits your foot the best. And I think, you know, something you said there, I mean, there the boots that you've worn like you said there's a lot of other boots that may fit your foot and what have you but you found one that works for your foot and you, it's like you know how finicky it can be and you know you you've probably heard the horror stories mm-hmm. of people in their feet but you found a boot that works for you and you're just sticking with it yeah absolutely um it's uh, i equate it to like a backpack as well i've gone through almost every backpack manufacturer there is and i finally got one where the harness just fits like absolutely perfect and um i'm just sticking with it (laughs) you know um it's same thing with boots um the boots are on a mountain hunt i'm gonna say that's probably one of your top three pieces of gear um if you don't have a pair of boots that fits you it doesn't matter how much they cost or what the brand name is you're not going to last long Chris, I apologize for the noise in the background. I don't know if you can hear it, but uh, uh, where I live here in Colorado in the summer, um, at random times, a guy comes by with a blower. It's part of the Homeowners Association. It decides to blow off all of the streets and what have you, and he's happened to pick uh, right in front of our house right when we're talking here. So if if it's bad, I apologize. Today, so you have extensive background as being a mountain hunter. Um, you you love those mountain hunts, and um, but you have a whole outline that you've prepared and done a lot of thinking on uh, going guided. And I just thought I'd kind of turn it over to you, and and uh, I'll interject uh, where I can and ask you questions. But uh, you've put a lot of time into this you know, going guided, my first question would be, you know, kind of what got you started in trying to, you know, create an outline and help other people, um, you know, picking a guide and, and what have you, picking in the, yeah. right, the right outfit and what have you. Yeah, so um, one of the big criticisms, I guess, that I've always heard from people that have uh, never gone on a guided trip is that, oh, like, you know, it's kind of like you're just paying to kill an animal, it's guaranteed, and whatnot, and it's absolutely not true whatsoever. Like, so I kind of, um, I do uh, write for uh, a column for Big Game Illustrated, and they're actually um, publishing a series, like the series, I'm calling it Going Guided, in there, but um, really I wanted, like, the average person that maybe has never done one of these trips to kind of get an insight to what it's actually like and what it's all about. It's not a guaranteed kill. It's not a guaranteed hunt. It's not, you know, um, putting your feet up and watching TV every night and going out and just pulling the trigger, or at least it doesn't have to be that way. Um, It's really about expanding your opportunities and um, understanding why you would actually pay money to go on a guided uh, hunt yourself versus just do DIY all the time. And like, I've done a ton of DIY hunts this, like, I'm not exclusively a guided, a guy that goes guided every trip I go on, but, um, there's a ton of benefits to it. And I really want, wanted people to, um, understand why you would choose this option and kind of debunk some of the myths that, um, that it's a sure thing. And, uh, really, the beginning of my experience with going on a guided trip um, came when I moved to Alberta. You know, when you're when you're a kid in high school or college, you know, you got all kinds of time to, um, you know, just go hunting, take every weekend you want. But, uh, you know, as I got older, had a family and whatnot, and I had friends that started getting families, you know, you make plans for a weekend and they call you an hour before you're ready to go out and uh, they have to cancel something came up 
or, um, you know, lots of other things in life pop up and kind of get in the way and your plans are changed or canceled. And so really that was kind of the uh, tipping point for me when I decided to look into it was I was just tired of my hunting partners bailing out and because usually on these mountain trips, you know, they're backpack trips and you're carrying some gear, your partner's carrying some gear. And if one of you can't go, it's probably not, doesn't make sense to go out there. Cause if you do get something down, you're not going to be able to get it out uh, on your own very easily. So that's really when I started picking up the phone and talking to a few of the local outfitters and asking them like, you know, what would this cost if I came as a resident, had my own tag, like really, I just needed a horse, horse and a hunting partner and a, you know, wall tent. And, um, that's kind of how it all started. One question that comes to mind when I hear that is, so before you went on a guided hunt, were you one of these people that were super adamant DIY, like, like I'm a DIY and, you know, put your foot down and, and it had, didn't have an open mind to doing a guided hunt. And if so, did you, how did you make the transformation to thinking that, okay, maybe I need to, you know, branch out a little bit? Yeah. So I'd say I used to be of that mindset, like I can do this myself. And, um, where I grew up, um, quote, rich Americans were the only ones that ever came up and did guided hunts. Like my, uh, a friend of mine, uh, his dad was an outfitter for deer and, you know, they'd have all these guys from Texas and whatnot coming up every fall and, you know, throwing down big tips for them, giving them their rifles at the end of the trips. Like, and I just remember being like, wow, these guys are so rich. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, so that's kind of what my perception was, but after I got working for a living, you know, started working and, and, uh, I never ruled out going on a guided hunt, but I never had really thought of doing one locally, like in my own province or state. Um, I'd always thought, Oh, you know, one day I'd like to go to Alaska or the Yukon, maybe get a moose or something like that, that I couldn't get at home. But, uh, eventually that evolved into looking at resident opportunities and uh, like I said, it really, what kind of the straw that broke the camel's back into really pursuing this was um, that some of my hunting partners had bailed on me in the last minute um, before we were supposed to go on, you know, after you take a week's vacation and you're ready to walk out the door and all of a sudden they're not going, it kind of spoils the whole trip for you. So um, that was, like I said, that was kind of the straw that uh, broke the camel's back and for me, you know, maybe opening my mind up to it and starting to investigate some of these options. Yeah, for sure. Um, now that you've gone on a few guided hunts, you know, what are the benefits that you see of going on guided hunts? Well, I guess the biggest benefit that I've found is um, you don't have to rely on a buddy to be able to go. Um, you know, if you're going with an outfitter, they're going to be there. And, um, so that's, that's a huge one there. Just having like that reliability. So um, are, are, another... you, are you saying like, in essence, you're saying like it almost, the outfitter almost becomes your hunting partner or your guide it... that you're going with almost becomes your hunting partner for that hunt. And you're looking at mm-hmm. it as, you, you know, if you and a buddy planned it, that's great, but you're looking at it that you're going with an outfitter or a guide and you're kind of doing this with them and you know one thing that would that make me think is you better like the outfitter or the guide you're going with but we i'm sure that's going to come up later yeah absolutely and uh you know like i don't want it to make it sound like oh i'm just going with an outfitter because i need a hunting buddy um because there's way more to it than that but uh when i go on a guided trip I do not book the trip based on the outfitter. I base it, I book the trip based on my guide. Um, when I went, got my stone sheep, I booked that trip because of the guide that I wanted. And, um, you know, there's a thousand outfitters out there and they all can provide a relative, you know, level of service for the most part. Um, but it's really that guy you're going to be living in, living on the mountain with day in and day out that makes all the difference in the world. So, 
that's that's kind of what I focus on when I'm looking at who I'm going to hunt with next is who do I actually want to be on the mountain day after day with. Um, so that's kind of a, yeah, that's a big thing for me. Um, cause like you say, there's no point in being out there with a guy that you can't stand. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, yes. What are some um, of the other benefits you see? Yeah. So the other benefit is, um, be- like for myself anyways, I work at a, uh, head office of a big oil company. I'm very busy Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, on the weekends, I've got, you know, three young children I got to spend all kinds of time with. So I do not have the time to properly scout a lot of different uh, areas, especially the further into the mountain and backcountry they get. Like the, the time restraints um, that I'm under, I just can't do it anymore. Whereas when I was younger, I did have the time to do a bit of that. But now it's, you know, almost an impossibility, I would say to uh, spend a week just scouting. So, you know, if you're going with an outfitter and you know he's in a certain area that you've always wanted to hunt, um, those guys will know that area. They'll know where to hunt in it. So they'll know how to hunt it, the terrain, you know, where the glassing spots are. Um, they're, you're essentially paying for a lot of the leg, like a lot of the leg work that you could have done yourself. You're, um, I'm gonna say essentially paying for that, for that localized knowledge of the area. Um, and, you know, if it's a new species you've never hunted as well, yeah, you know, hunting a sheep is different than hunting a mule deer is different than hunting an elk is different than hunting a antelope. Like all these animals take specialized skills. And if you've never hunted a sheep before, you can't just show up on the mountain and think you're going to have a chance at getting one. Um, it typically doesn't work. Like, you know, the odd guy might get lucky, but um, you have to really learn how to hunt those species and if you don't know how to hunt a certain species that guide uh he'll know the area and he'll know how to hunt that animal so that's a huge benefit in my opinion especially if it's a specialty animal like a sheep that you might not get a lot of opportunity to hunt um for the average guy like uh, in a bc in alberta here we're pretty fortunate because we can get these over-the-counter tags but you know if you're in the lower 48 um and you pull a once in a lifetime tag, you know, I think you'd be crazy not to um, look at getting some localized knowledge anyway for, for that t- tag. For sure. Um, um, one question I want to bounce back to something you said. Um, it's, it's a little bit off topic, but um, you said you work in the oil fields. Um, yep. That always intrigues me. What exactly do you do and how long have you been doing it? Okay, um, so actually, I I work uh, for a pipeline company, Trans Canada Pipelines, and uh, uh, specifically on the Keystone um, project. And um, right now, we're kind of in a holding pattern till get the next round of permits going. But um, before that, I actually worked in the oil sands for about seven years. And uh, but even in uh, high school and university, I had worked for um, other pipelining companies. Um, doing pipeline maintenance and things like that. So I've always kind of been on this pipeline side of the fence with the exception of uh, my time in the oil sands, I guess. And when you say Um, oil sands, what does that mean? uh, That's like uh, Fort McMurray, or I guess in the U.S., like a lot of the environs will call it the tar sands. Um, And it's basically this huge basin in northern Alberta where um, oil basically saturates this layer of sand like it's like a big band at a certain depth and they'll um, essentially mine it i guess and run it through the processing plants and get the oil out of the sand itself so in other words they're extracting oil out of the sand and i would assume that there's sand deposits after they extract the oil out and and so I, I bet they have a very complex process to do that. Yeah, it's a pretty complex uh, process. And like when you see the side of the mine cut, it's like a layer of clean sand, a band of oil sands, and then the above it, it's like all clean sand again. So it's this very specific band in the strata. And um, yeah, they grind it up and there's all the, the processing that they do to get it uh coming out the other side is pretty extensive but when it comes out um the sin crude or synthetic crude is what they call it and it actually is almost the color of diesel so there's not a whole lot of refining that they have to do after it but um 
yeah, it's it's quite a fascinating uh, area and process and whatnot. So, um, and then did you study in college to do what you're doing now? Um, so I'm uh, in project controls. So what that is, because most people have heard that term, we do like the cost, the schedule, the progressing of a of a lot of these major projects. And uh, in school and university, I actually got my business degree and. Uh, as I was looking for a job in my with my degree, um, I actually went to Fort McMurray to the oil sands and got my electrical ticket as well. So I'm a journeyman electrician with a business degree, and that kind of all translated into uh, working in the major projects for the cost and schedule and progress because I had been on the ground level or been um, in the field, I should say, uh, worked on the tools, got all the um, technical knowledge and skills and whatnot, and I was able to translate that back to uh, the home office here. So um, it's not a typical path, I would say, of most college graduates, but, uh, man, there's nothing uh, more valuable than, you know, learning how to work with your hands and seeing what it actually takes to build some of this stuff. For sure. And so, like, now, your everyday, you know, stuff that you're doing every day now, is it are you out in the field, you know, working with your hands, or are you more in the office? What, you it, know, what do you do? It's basically a hundred percent in the office now. Um, whenever we do have a major project, we'll have like my counterpart will be in the, on site with the contractors at, a, say, a pump station or at a pipeline right away or something like that. And uh, I will go out to the field periodically um, for meetings with them and. To, see how things are progressing in the field. But um, for the most part, uh, I am in the home office here now. Okay. And these pipelines you discussed, you mentioned the Keystone. Yeah. A little bit of education here. Um, and uh, this just intrigues me. So yeah. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. But um, where is the oil coming from and where is it going? So most of the oil, um, at least on our uh system is coming from northern alberta so chris you were telling me about your job and then um your building actually had a uh, a uh, a fire drill and the whole building was evacuated um yeah bef- before before that happened uh i think i asked you the question where is the oil coming from and where is it going yeah, um, so uh, it's actually coming from uh, mainly from primarily from northern Alberta, um, from the oil sands, and uh, going all through the um, central U.S. down to uh, Cushing, Oklahoma, which is uh, the major one of the major hubs in the U.S. And then from uh, Cushing down to the uh, Gulf Coast refineries in uh, Galveston and Texas City and those areas. Uh, there's also a few. Uh, uh, feeder pipelines and other uh, refineries uh, in the U.S. that it um, picks up oil from and delivers off to as well. So, um, yeah, that's that's primarily where all the oil ends up is in uh, that Houston, greater Houston area. Okay. Okay, interesting. Um, back to our outline and back to kind of our topic of, you know, going guided We've talked about some of the benefits of going guided, um, yep. and then why don't you take it away with um, starting it out, planning your first guided hunt? Yep, uh, for sure. Um, well, the one other point I was going to make, too, for some of the benefits of guide, guided uh, before we keep moving on was um, it does give you the opportunity to hunt other species as well. Um, if you're a guy from the Midwest, you know, you basically are going to have to go with an outfitter to hunt a mountain goat. Um, you just can't walk into a place like BC or um, whatnot and buy an over-the-counter tag for that. So it really does open up uh, a big window of opportunity to uh, hunt for some other species you may not have uh, actually had an opportunity at before. So that was one other thing I just really wanted to mention as well for just some of the benefits. Yeah, good point. Okay, um, so starting out on going on a guided trip, um, I made the mistake, and I'm calling it a mistake now, uh, looking at it in hindsight, of booking a trip to Alaska. So 
that uh, is a big trip if you're from the lower 48, but it's even a bigger trip if you're from Canada like I am because now it's not just traveling to another area. It's firearm permits. It's export permits for the wildlife. It's an extra layer of complexity. Um, what I should have done was I should have booked like a small trip, um, like say a black bear hunt or a antelope hunt or something a lot less substantial that would have taken a lot less planning to get my feet wet. Um, a smaller trip like that, you know, you're still going to have like, you know, asking the outfitter the same types of questions. Um, you're still going to encounter the same types of issues, but on a much smaller scale. And if something does go wrong, you know, you're maybe out a little bit of money versus like a huge Alaskan trip where you're going to be out a whole ton of money. And, um, you know, it was kind of like when we, when my friend and I, we actually did a two on one up there, 21 day backpack trip. Uh, we had uh, tags for three species each. And, um, you know, we were, uh, in my opinion, we didn't ask all the right questions before we went and we were in way over ahead. Luckily on the back end, um, like we had done enough research that we knew who to talk to. We'd even called the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Office and got a specific person's name. So when we were ready to leave Alaska and come back to Alberta here, we had their um, export permits uh, lined up. We had every like all the firearm permits we needed figured out. So that piece of it went smooth. But um, the trip itself, though, you know, we had some challenges, but it was a lot to do with we didn't really know what to expect. What was those three species? Uh, I had tags for a grizzly, a moose, and a dull sheep. And uh, my uh, hunting partner there that came up with me, he had the dull sheep, the grizzly, and a caribou tag. Okay. Yeah. And um, at the end of it, uh, we both got our dull sheep. Uh, we got a double header actually on that day. And uh, my friend got a. a nice representative caribou and i could have taken a moose but the guide uh told me you know lay off the trigger we can do better and then of course we never ended up getting one but uh to his cr credit um we did see an absolute monster um the next day so you know we po potentially could have come up with pretty good moose but uh i kind of did regret not taking the one like the um, one that was in hand at the time, but you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So, sure, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, like I was mentioning, if, when you're starting out, I would recommend you know really taking off on something that's manageable. Um, you know, and I would even say go with a uh, to an area where you can actually drive possibly to the place just take the whole airlines out of the whole equation. It just makes it that much simpler and, um, you know, f get things figured out on some, on a small trip, maybe two. And then if you, you know, if your dream is like the big Alaska adventure or, um, some Canadian wilderness hunt, then, you know, that's the next step. Um, okay. In my opinion. So, um, and then, you know, once, once you kind of figured out to, uh, what you plan on that you want to do, I guess the really the next step is booking your trip. And, you know, when you go to book your trip, trip, this is really what's going to make the difference between the trip of a lifetime or an absolute uh, catastrophe. And, um, you know, like on your podcast, you have a lot of outfitters uh, come on that, and you know these guys and, they talk about stuff and they're probably in the top tier of outfitters and, you know, they're well known. Um, but there really is a lot of guys that are, you know, take two, three hunters a year, just hang a shingle up, make a few bucks on the side. So like, you know, do your due diligence, really know um, who you're getting involved with when you decide to choose an outfitter. And uh, like I had mentioned before, when I book a trip, I, book it more based on who my guide's going to be versus who the outfitter is like obviously if the outfitter's got a bad reputation across the board then you know that's a outfit to stay away from but 
um, all things being equal, you know, um, I, for the most part, research the guides as much as I do the outfit and um, kind of pick who I actually want to what, uh, what's your thoughts with. on when you're researching a hunt and you go online and say you find one negative review and some guy's all bent out of shape and this, that, and the other? Do you does that hold as much weight to you as if maybe obviously you found you know a bunch of really good reviews and then you've got one guy that's obviously had a bad trip? I mean, is there any um, margin of error that you? look at or if if any one outfitter has any negative do you automatically you know try and look for someone else or do you you know you know how human nature is sometimes where you can just get some guy and yeah you know for whatever reason he's all been out of shape but really maybe the problem was on his side and and yeah just trying to make excuses what are your thoughts on that yeah so like i've um I've hunted with some big outfits and I've hunted with some small outfits and some well-known ones and some basically unknown ones. And I can tell you virtually every outfit, if they've been in business for any amount of time, will have a negative review somewhere along the line from some unhappy client. And um, I've done enough of these hunts now to kind of be able to read between the lines on some of these comments. And, you know, some of them... Um, like, uh, if there's only one or two, it's usually something to the effect like, uh, you know, the guy never got an animal, so he's blaming it on the guide or the outfitter, or, um, potentially there was weather issues involved, um, things out of the, out of their control. Um, most outfitters that I have come across that are like the better outfitters, if something happens on your trip. Um, and it's their fault and um, whatnot, they will either bring you back um, again or they will make it right somehow. Um, the fly-by-night guys, maybe not so much, but I've found that some of the, uh, um, I don't want to say poor quality outfitters, but uh, there's some outfitters that have a bad reputation. It's not just the odd negative comment it'll be extensive across the board and you'll see like it on social media you'll see it on um, some of these like go hunt uh, type of reviews and um, like all these different sites that rate outfitters there'll be all kinds of comments about them and it's not just an isolated incident but um, you know if you want to hunt with a specific outfitter and you're researching them online and you find one negative review, I wouldn't automatically write them off. There's a lot of keyboard warriors out there that talk tough behind the keyboard, but, um, you know, when it, if they had to say it to the guy's face, they never would. Right. So, yeah, you know, I, I, he, I think that's important to note that, you know, you know, like you said, if you've been in business long enough, you're going to have someone that was not um, happy with whatever situation and, you know, yeah. you may never hear a review from them or they may be the loudest critic out there. Um, but I like yeah. to try and give guys benefit of the doubt or I'm, I might even talk to them and say, hey, there's a guy yeah. so-and-so and he's saying this, like, what's your side of it? So, I mean, there, as we know, there's always two sides to every story and I'm not defending any out. I mean, I am an outfitter. I'm not defending outfitters, but yeah. like in anything else, I would say, and I, I think most people can read between the lines pretty well but you know give give the fellow man uh, a break and and you know maybe get his side of the story of what happened and you might find out that hey the guy's saying well the guy missed five times and you know he he couldn't go more than a mile and yeah you know he was totally out of shape and you know this is a mountain hunt and I, I'm not sure what he expected but he was not prepared for the hunt I, yeah I, I, I know that that happens a lot. Yeah, and like I'll just give you one example of that because uh, I've got a lot of friends that are guides as well, and um, my one friend he was quite young. He's about I want to say twenty three to twenty five at the time, and and uh, he was a wrangler and he wanted his big chance at being the guide. And uh, you know, guy rolls into camp and he was four hundred pounds, and of course that ends up being his first client, and. Uh, 
just to get them on the horse, they had to get the biggest, like, uh, I can't remember the breed, but it was one of the biggest horses you could possibly get. And the guy had to walk up a couple stairs or stumps to even get on this thing. And uh, amazingly enough, uh, my buddy there got him, got him so close to getting a ram, all he had to do was walk 20 yards up a hill and a fairly steep incline. And three hours later, he still wasn't at the top of it. And the ram was bedded there all day. And, you know, he just never made it to the top at the end of the day. So, you know, that guy, I don't know if he complained um, bitterly at the end of the trip or not, but, you know, his physical ability was so bad that it was his fault that he never got around. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I've heard lots of stories about guys not being able to shoot and, and, uh, whatnot, but, you know, from the guides that I have actually hunted with, those guys are dialed in, they know their animals, they know how to hunt them. Um, they know how to find them, and if uh, the client doesn't get get an animal, it's usually not because of something they did. Yeah, um, that's what I found, anyways. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, so like like you said, yeah, it's got to be taken with a grain of salt. These um, online reviews, because um, you know, I like to give the, give people the benefit of the doubt as well, and even like you say call the outfitter and ask them about that specific instance and their version of the story is probably a little different than um the guy that's complaining yeah and i feel like sometimes um when you give an outfitter or give a person to give their side of the story i think a lot of times that also tells what kind of person they are if they say well yeah it was a misfortunate situation and here's you know kind of what happened or yeah. if the guy says, oh, yeah, da, 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 and then he gets on his own horse, then sometimes that sends up red flags to me. Like, you know, yeah. I, I want to hunt with someone that is, you know, has a lot of grace and someone that is willing to, you know, there's a lot of times someone's booking a hunt with me because mm-hmm. they're not as experienced as I am. So for me to get on my horse and talk about, oh, my level of, of experience yeah you know there's there's certainly i i like it when i talk to people and you know bring up an unfortunate situation and they say yeah you know here's what happened and you know but they don't attack the person so i I think that's something you know just kind of watch if you do get in that situation and you interview someone you know if they if they go on the attack and you know, try and put all of the blame on the hunter and they don't take any of the blame and, you know, they don't accept any of the responsibility, that might throw a red flag up for me as well. Yeah, for sure. And uh, like I've mentioned before, like um, I do know one situation where um, a friend of mine went on a, on a fairly substantial trip and uh, it was for a stone sheep and the um, guide that he had was pretty inexperienced and uh at the end of the trip he never got around and like he was even finding like more stone sheep than the guide and uh you know anyone that's hunted stone sheep will tell you they're probably the most difficult sheep species to pick out of the rocks just their coloration and and whatnot so they're quite difficult to find if your eye's not trained for that and uh he was picking up you know more sheep than the guide was which is very unusual in that situation and uh the outfitter uh, made it right, brought him back the next year, and he got his uh, got his ram. But you know, um, so in that situation, you know, the outfitter um, took some responsibility, or um, I don't want to say blame, but he took some responsibility for the hunt not working out, and um, was gracious enough to bring the hunt, the guy back and uh, made good on it. So, um, which he never had to do, but it was I, I thought pretty highly of him for doing that. For sure. So you're talking about yeah. starting out and planning your hunt, and you're saying yep. make make your first guided hunt maybe a smaller hunt, maybe something that you can drive to, you know, kind of eliminate yeah. the airlines, eliminate, um, you know, some of the stuff that you have no control over. And, yeah. and then once exactly. you get comfortable with a couple of those hunts, then go ahead and book some of those big adventure hunts, um, you know, in other countries yeah. and what have you. Yeah, I would 
like uh, I guess it's just like anything else. Like you know, you got to learn the ropes, and you can read all you want about how to do stuff. And you know, people write columns and articles all the time about like travel hunting and what to look for and what you know this and that. But until you've actually done it, um, you just can't be ready. For, like it's it's kind of like going on your first sheep hunt until you've actually done it. You have no idea what you're really in for. Um, it's it's just some it's just totally a totally different uh, way to travel than you normally ever would. So, um, yeah, that's my that be my recommendation anyway. And and I've talked to a few um, of my friends that have done a few trips, and um, they all have said the same thing. Like, and even. The, and when I say a smaller trip, I don't even, I'm not even necessarily talking about the price tag. I'm talking about, like you were just saying, eliminate the airlines, something small, you know, probably no more than a week long and whatnot. Because there are some, I'm going to call them adventure hunts, that um, are big trips, even though they're not expensive, like uh, the carib- like a caribou trip up in the Northern Territories or like a muskox hunt that I just came back from. You know, they're not overly expensive but they're a huge trip huge logistical challenges um huge adventure but not something i'd recommend for um a first time uh travel hunter or guy that's going guided for the first time you bring up that muskox hunt didn't you shoot a giant yeah um actually i just had it uh, scored for sci last this past weekend and it looks like it's going to be number 23 all time in the book for that. And uh, I'm getting it scored for Boone and Crockett here uh, this week coming up. And just based on the entries that have been in the um, current record book and some of the measurements I've taken myself at home, they're obviously not official, but um, I think it's going to be in the top 20 all time Boone and Crockett as well. So That's phenomenal. Um, Did you freeze your balls off up there? It was cold. Um, it was 35 below Celsius. I'm not sure what that equates to in Fahrenheit, but it's freaking cold. Oh my and gosh! It was uh, minus 60 Celsius just a few weeks before we went up there. And like I grew up on the prairies in Saskatchewan, and it was we had that kind of temperatures as when I was growing up as a kid. Um, so I kind of knew how to dress and what to expect and how to not get frostbite and freeze um, and whatnot. So I was fairly comfortable because um, we were spending, you know, 12-plus hours a day outside. On snowmobiles or, or what? Yeah. Um, so how they hunt those is typically, um, like, well, on this trip we went on, we were specifically looking for some herds that uh, my friend actually owned the outfit. So he was telling me they'd found these new herds that they didn't know, didn't know exist or were there before. So we were going to hunt this kind of fresh uh, group of muskox that no one's hunted for decades, as far as they know. And uh, we actually had to snowmobile eight hours across the Arctic ocean um, to get to um, where we were base camp was. Okay, now are then, you on your own machine, or or are you riding with someone? So there was two options. We could have rented our own machine, um, or the other option is the Inuit um, pull these sixteen foot long freighter sleds, and the freighter sled has like a seat, and it's I, I don't want to say it's like a lazy boy, but it's kind of like well cushioned, and you know sit there and relax. Well, I shouldn't say relax either. It's pretty rough, but, uh, you know, look around. So I chose to uh, just ride in the freighter sled. Uh, the one buddy that came up on that trip with me, he rented his own machine. But uh, at the end of it, I was glad that I chose just to ride in the freighter sled because I had like a windscreen and um, it was kind of sheltered. And he was like, you know, his face is red from the... Was he following you? Uh, he, we were kind of riding like, like side by side. side, by side. Yeah. And he'd look like, over at you and you'd be like, yeah, I got a, I got a screen over here, buddy. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, man, it was, it was freaking cold though. Like, uh, but what a trip. Like, what did you um, see you know, out on the ice? Like, are, is it like blue ice or is it snow or like what? And then um, like, what, it, what would you see? Like polar bears? What were you? 
Um, so we actually found two inland grizzlies all the way up there. Um, the area we were, they said the odd polar bear will roll through, but not many in that specific area. Um, and the one guy got chased by the grizzly and they jumped on the snowmobile and started driving away and he kind of turned the camera behind him and clicked the picture, and the thing was maybe 20 yards full out charge at him. Oh my um, gosh! <laughs> yeah, so a it was pretty. One? Oh yeah, it was it was a monster. <laughs> like uh, it was it was a huge bear, and um, and then uh, we actually ended up shooting a seal on the ocean. Um, so that was pretty. That was pretty neat. And the Inuit said we were the first. Uh, like they call everybody that's not Inuit a sport hunter. Mm-hmm. So they said we were the first sport hunters that he knew of that had ever gotten a seal through the ice like that. What kind of seal was it? It was a ring seal, I think they called it. It was about uh, 200 pounds. It's a pretty good size one. And ha- I mean, like, okay, lots of questions here. So yeah. <laughs> you're, you're driving on the ice. How thick is the ice? Do you ever see water or is it just solid? Like, does it look just like, you know, perfect? you know, land, like, you, you know, you're not worried or yeah. you've seen spots of, of water and you're like, holy crap, this thing, you know, like. Yeah. So we were there before breakup. So like when the ice freezes up there, like the winds blow and stuff. So it's like these big, like ice shelves and like upheaval ice, but the ice is super thick. I can't remember how thick uh, the guide said. He said it was like eight or 10 feet thick, but he thought that was still shallow from what it normally can get to okay. for depth. So the ice is super thick. Um, so and we never seen open water, and there, like I wasn't. There's no like fear of going through. And is it but flat, or is is there snow drifts? Like it's I, I, big snow drifts and uh, ice upheavals and stuff uh, from the ocean that had pushed like you know the ice up, and so it's kind of the ocean itself is actually quite rough. But once you actually get to the tundra, it's flat as a pancake. And for a place that has 10 months a year of winter, there's hardly any snow. Like, uh, we were at the end of winter at before any of the melting had started, and the snow was only about four inches thick. And that kind of explained to me, anyways, how the muskox lived there all year. Because I was like, well, how can these huge, um, you know, mammals live up there um, with all that snow? But this, there's actually not a lot of snow there. And, what do they um, eat? It's basically grass. Um, we, uh, like I kicked a bunch of the snow away to kind of see what was on the tundra and it's really just grass, like a short grass. And uh, it's actually, there's actually a lot of it there. And uh, for people that don't know, a muskox is, um, like after we had it skinned out, the closest and boned out and took the meat, the closest animal that I can describe it to is probably a buffalo but about half the size. So, like, the one I got was exceptionally large, and it was about 900 pounds. How old was that sucker? Um, they, the Inuit guide I was with didn't really know, but he said for sure 10 plus, uh, 10 years or older. So he fa- he said they can live up to about 20, 22 years or something like that. How so, thick was their hide? Um, the hide itself wasn't that thick, but the fur on those things is like a wool and then it's got the long hair outside of it so everybody only sees the long hair but just underneath that long hair it's like solid wool and uh the interesting thing up there we got a wolf and an arctic fox as well um so like the wolf up there has wool as well and same with that arctic fox Hmm. and it's uh the i like not the wolves up there are nothing like the uh, timber wolf with a long you know, what you'd typically think a dog hair would look like. It's, um, they got the guard hairs, but it's solid wool underneath those guard hairs. So very well suited and adapted for the climate for sure. Interesting. Um, and back to the seal, how did you get the seal? So, uh, the Inuit said like, cause they have these breathe holes on the ocean and they said, you know, you can sit at one all day long and, wait till one comes up or if it's a sunny day and a little warmer they'll be up sunning themselves and the one day it got a little warmer and when i say a little warmer i mean like minus 25 instead of minus 35 um and uh yeah celsius yeah and uh you know we basically seen it and kind of 
got within about 200 yards of it. And uh, the one guy I was hunting with, um, he he uh, shot it just at the edge of the ice. But uh, the scary thing with those breathe holes, though, is I got a good picture of one, and the hole looks, you know, maybe 18 inches around. And uh, we reached over with our glove and just pushed the snow beside the hole, and the whole piece went down, and those holes are up to four feet uh, round. So if you were walking along and didn't know it was there, you could easily fall into the ocean. Oh, my and, gosh. Yeah, so that kind of was a bit of an eye-opener and made me a lot more conscientious. Which is pretty of, much death. I mean, if you fall yeah. in at that temperature, you're wet, you're, you're, I mean, you're yeah, basically it, done. And it's, like I said, eight hours, snowmobile rides to town, so... If you if you fell through, you would if you got wet to your core, you would be almost guaranteed to perish there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's. And, um, so did you get your muskox with a rifle or a bow? I got it with a rifle, um, and there's a lot. Like I probably could have got it with a bow. Uh, the two uh, other hunters in camp that I that were friends of mine, they took theirs with uh, archery gear, um, and after we after we like I was with the one guy when he got his with his bow and after I kind of figured out the whole program with the musk ox you know, and kind of figured out how to hunt them with a bow. Um, yeah, I think anybody could probably do it, but, um, yeah, I, I'm trying to get the super 10, which is one species category of every, uh, animal type in North America. And with, I wanted to do it with this r- specific rifle that I have. Cause my dad gave it to me when I was, uh, kid it was my first uh big game rifle so i'm trying to get That's all awesome. the species with that so what is it uh browning 270 a bolt nice yeah so i've taken all my sheep with that gun too so um it's just the just the gun i can't seem to get away from actually so yeah that's awesome is your dad still around yeah yeah he is um he he still hunts with an old uh 303 uh british wow <laughs> so, cool <laughs> yeah but uh cool so that sounds like a heck of a trip um uh yeah did you uh do a lot of the inuits wear seal hats uh no they but they wear a fur hat but they're not necessarily seal and they all wear for the most part um these big fur mitts that are made out of wolf or some of them are seal skin and uh in town a lot of them wear like the mucklucks and stuff um but they're for the most part wearing modern boots and uh the interesting thing like those people are so so interesting we went to the cult we got storm state in town a day before we hit the ice there and we went to the local cultural center and just such a interesting history. They document how they came over the Bering Sea Strait and how they migrated over from the coast of Alaska across the northern Canada. Um, it's very interesting. And um, but the, int- the really interesting thing are guides. They were both. Um, I'm going to call them. Um, uh, real came from very traditional Inuit families. The one guy. Uh, like they're both in their fifties, mid to late fifties. Um, the one guy was actually born in an igloo. Um, the other guy was actually born on a, in a tent on the tundra. And the only reason he wasn't born in an igloo was because it was summertime when he was born. And these guys have a house. Like the one guy in particular was very nomadic. He has a house, but he's maybe there six weeks a year. And the rest of the time he's, um, going to all their traditional fishing and hunting grounds and it really gave me a new appreciation for what uh traditional land use is when when the native people start talking about that because um like the one guide i said like i said he told me like these different spots he went to and i was just like that is like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles from the furthest south to the furthest northern tip that he's traveling and it's just a constant migration all year round, depending on the season. So, um, very interesting um, people and way of life, and uh, very interesting culture. And I like, like I said, that was probably on the adventure side, probably one of the biggest adventure uh, trips I've ever been on. Yeah, it sounds incredible, um, for sure. Well, congratulations on your giant musk ox. 
Um, yeah, thank you. Really, really cool. Um, let's talk about booking a hunt. Yeah. So for booking um, the trip, there's a lot of key things that you should really know about before you pull the trigger and actually book. Um, some of them surround like the outfitters flexibility when it comes to schedule like some of them you know you have to fly in um, on a Sunday and you leave on a Sunday some of them you know you can come in midweek or leave early if you want uh, you know know their refund policies or if you cancel you know have it clearly defined if you're going to get all your money back or what that looks like um, you know some outfitters will be a lot stickier than others depending on what species it's for. Um, and then uh, the other thing really too you need to know is, is there other additional species that are available and is it realistic to get more animals? So um, I'll just give you a good example. If you're on a sheep hunt um, in BC, I'm going to use BC for an example, um, there's usually always extra species you can have a tag for, but um you know, what's realistic to take on a sheep hunt. Probably a mountain goat is a realistic expectation, um, assuming you get your sheep early. And, you know, there might be an opportunity where a moose or something you, you catch in the mountain valley or a bear maybe, but realistically you're probably looking at uh, a mountain goat as a second species on a trip like that. So um, the other thing too is if you're a person that's um, chasing some kind of a slam or whatnot those secondary species are you know good to have the tag in your back pocket for them if that's something that you're you're after it's just a lot uh, cheaper way to do it and chances are you will tag out before the last day of your hunt as well so you might have some time to hunt for an extra animal um good good, and, good stuff there i'm getting a little scratching um, maybe on your microphone just oh, okay that. is that a little better yeah i'm sure it's i'm sure it's better oh, okay okay um, um Okay, keep going. Yeah, and that, uh, another thing that you really want to ask your outfitter about too is what the accommodations um, are going to be. Like, are you going to be in a backpack tent, a wall tent, a cabin? Um, do you have to get a hotel before a day before the hunt and a day after? Um, you know, what kind of food are you going to be eating? That was a big mistake when we went to Alaska. You know, we knew we were going to be eating Mountain House. Like, that's just the nature of a backpacking trip. But we didn't realize it was going to be Mountain House three times a day, seven days a week with uh, not, nothing else kind of uh, and that can either, That can have an effect on your body. You can either have to go to the bathroom 40 times a day or you can go like yeah. six days and never even have to use the restroom. Yeah, and my buddy that came on that trip with me there... Yeah, I think he was hiding behind the bush about, like you say, 40 times a day for the first couple of days. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then uh, once he got that kind of out of the system. But uh, the biggest problem I found with Mountain House, though, is there's just not enough calories in it. So, like, a two-person meal has about 600 calories in that. So, um, you know, considering you're burning probably five or 6,000 calories a day, there's you can't even physically eat enough food to replace what you're burning um so that was kind of my my key issue with the mountain house over a long duration of time anyway but uh let's, let's go off on a little bunny trail here what have you sure. found food wise on these mountain hunts what works best for you um time and time again it comes back to a, like stuff with a lot of almonds in it um just seems to be like a high protein high energy source um i've tried those goo packs as well which I found actually were not bad for energy, but um, I can't, myself, I can't eat more than maybe one a day. If I have a couple of them, I just kind of feel sick, I guess. But um, Because of the sugar, you think? I think so. I think that's what it is. But like one a day, it's not bad, and it seems to be like some kind of sustained energy. Um, lots of like uh, granola bars and stuff like that, too, I like, and jerky um do you yeah, take raw al almonds in the field uh, i often do yeah salted um, or unsalted or uh i typically do unsalted i know some guys like the salt salted because you know you're sweating and it's kind of replacing some electrolyte but uh um 
I found, uh, cause I was, when I was doing some of these big hikes in the mountains in particular, I was finding I was getting a lot of leg cramps. So I started, um, uh, getting like those electrolyte kind of juice crystals, I guess uh, you'd call them and putting that in my drink. So those are pretty salty. So I, yeah, between that and the mountain house and how salty those are, um, yeah, like the rest of my food, I try not to really get stuff that's extra salted, I guess, for so myself anyway. Do you do any mountain house for your meals or do you do other meal? What's your meal plan? Um, so lots of mountain house, obviously, because it's, um, I guess, easy and compact and dehydrated and it's convenient at the end of the day. But uh, lots of bars. Uh, like I used which to bring, one specifically? Uh, cl- I like the Cliff uh, peanut butter bars. Um, and what I do find though, is some of that stuff is sits a little heavy in your gut. So if you've got a big hike, it might not be the best thing to eat at the start of it. But you know, when you're going to be sitting down and glassing for a few hours, um, we'll eat some cliff bars. Um, I do have a sweet tooth, so I do bring in some chocolate bars. I don't know if, uh, like Snickers, Mars bars kind of thing. I don't know how good that is, but you know, it's calories and you're eating and it gives you something anyway. Um, lots of trail mix type of like nuts and raisins and that kind of stuff. Um, bit of dehydrated fruit, like bananas that maybe some apple chips. And, um, I know, I know there's certain guys like, uh, Jason Harrison, who's been on your podcast there. They've got all that stuff right down to a science for like, you know, maximum calories and, and, uh, they've got a pretty defined day-to-day meal plan that they, they use. But, um, I basically just try to, um, pack stuff that I like as well, because I found that I, I was getting into more of like the, okay, I need X number of calories in this. And then what I was finding was I didn't really like it and I wasn't eating. So now then you're I, just carrying around stuff that you're not eating. Exactly. And, and, uh, you know, when you get back from a backpack trip, you really should have no food left. And I was finding like, geez, I got an awful lot of stuff in here that I could have replaced with something else that I actually would have eaten. So that's good um, stuff. And by the way, the listeners, um, I am going to be doing a podcast with Jason and Brendan, and they're going to go over their actual piece by piece food list for their upcoming hunt. Um, I've yeah. actually gotten quite a few requests to get them to give their food, and so they're going to be doing that here coming up. So. Yeah, no, that'll be uh, really interesting. And like, um, I'm all, I'm constantly refining what I'm taking for food in my pack as well. So, um, you know, I, I try new as new stuff comes out for backpacking food. I try it because sometimes I'll find out oh, I just like this better and replace something that I currently take. And you know, constantly upgrading. I guess so. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so. You're, you're talking about booking the hunts. We got off on food, which is great. Yeah. Um, I- any more things when booking a hunt? Yeah. Um, so a lot of guys always talk about this reference list. And I'm sure you've been asked for one a hundred times. And I know they're usually, oh, yeah, here's our reference list. Call them. I never bother calling any of those guys. And the reason I don't call them Oh, I shouldn't say I don't call them. I don't call them to find out how good the outfit or the hunt was. And the reason I don't call them is typically the guys on the list had a good experience. Maybe they got a big good animal. They're typically going to give positive reviews um, regardless. So what I do, if I do call them, what I call them about is like um, details of the hunt. Like they just stay in the tent or, you know, things that are not relevant to how good the hunt was, but like kind of so I can... details. Yeah, details on what they, I yeah yeah what I can expect from it because typically they're all going to say they had a good trip and that's why they're on the reference list. But um, the guys that I actually do talk to are the guides, and um, most outfitters I've like on these bigger trips anyway. You know, if it's a smaller trip, it's a little different. But like on a big sheep trip, um, when you're you know, tied at the hip with this guide. And it's like, he's not a guide. He's your hunting partner is the way I view that relationship. And, um, so I typically will call him like uh, in the off season, 
before the hunt and and um just really ask him what should i bring because the outfitter will have a list but the guide usually has a little different take on what you should bring and what you don't need to bring and um i've always found that the guide that that i'm hunting with and the outfitters list aren't 100 percent in alignment so um that's the guy that i actually kind of trust to really tell me what the hunt is going to be like and what to expect because they're the ones living it day in and day out and you know they're out there every day with you and they want that hunt to go as good as it possibly can go and they want you to be as comfortable as you possibly can be and um they're not going to give you a big story about you know oh you're going to shoot a boone and crockett whatever they're going to tell you what the realistic expectations are whereas if you're only talking to the ever talking to the outfitter you know it's always going to i shouldn't say it's always going to sound good but it's more than likely always going to sound good and uh i know in some cases it can build up false expectations so um i really do like talking to the actual guide themselves it's good Um, advice yeah um, and then uh, just the one other thing that's worth mentioning, too, is, like, these booking agents. So, like, today there's more of these hunting consultants than there's ever been before in history, I think. Like, everybody's got their shingle out as a hunting consultant. Um, you know, there's probably really only a handful of them out there that have guys working the phones that have done a lot of these trips and have hunted with that outfit or their trying to book you with and actually know uh, what you're going to encounter when you go. Um, like I know, I know I had uh, one consultant, I won't mention the company they worked for, but um, they're talking to me and I was like, Oh, I'm interested in, I can't even remember what species it was now. And they came back and it's like, Oh, I got this guy and I got that guy. And well, they had a list, all they had was a list of inventory they were trying to sell. They didn't actually know anything about Yeah, and they're trips. making a commission on the deal. So, I mean, people exactly. need to understand, like, and no disrespect to the booking agents out yeah. there, there are some good ones. But if the guy you're talking to hasn't been on that hunt, he really yeah. shouldn't even be talking to you about it. What exactly. he hears people say and what, you know, some list or, you know, that, that oh, yeah, so and so is supposed to be good, but. Like, I, I kind of take offense sometimes to mm-hmm. the whole booking agent process because it seems like you said it, there's, you know, so many of them out there and half of them have never even been on those hunts. And it, it's like, would you take, you know, stock yeah. picking advice from someone that hasn't done extremely well picking stocks? Or would you, you know, invest in real estate with someone that's never even owned real estate it, it, you know yeah and yeah and exactly. just because someone goes on one hunt doesn't mean that they're good or they have knowledge about another hunt and you know that obviously yeah. you can tell from my voice it's kind of picked a soft spot nerve. With, or a nerve yeah. with me because it's just it's turned into this big business and it's yeah, like and it's great if you're talking to someone that's like yeah i've been on you know eight sheep hunts i've killed eight rams or five rams or three rams or 12 rams or whatever it is then you yeah. can go okay this guy's been there he's done that he knows what to expect but like when you're talking to a guy and he's like well i actually haven't even gone on a sheep hunt yet well e- you yeah. need to find someone else to talk to um, yeah not uh that one in particular the sheep hunt ones um i've quit talking to consultants period about them because i've found that uh, eight out of ten of them have never been on a sheep hunt number one and uh, number two the guys that have been on one were with one guy in alaska or with one guy here like they they haven't been around um you know like if the if the guy's killed two grand slams and has hunted with 15 different outfits i'll talk to them all day long but the average guy just has not um hunted sheep in particular um at very many places it's just too expensive the tag availability is low it's just not a reality like if i ever drew a desert sheep tag i'm gonna talk to a guy like yourself yeah you're the outfitter but you've done it um you're well known you know what you're talking about you've killed many rams you know what you're looking at like i i'll talk to a 
guy like you versus a guy that just wants to meet a book with you. Yeah. Well, and, and I think to, to, to defend booking agents a little bit too, yeah. if you talk to someone and they're like, you know, I've only been on, if they say, I've only been on one sheep hunt, it was with this outfit, I, you know, I had a good hunt. I can't tell you specifically, but I can tell you what I know from what people have told me. And here's some other references that you can call and, you know, I'll turn you in the right direction. I just want to encourage the listeners out there to be aware of some of these some of these so-called yeah. experts that that really have not done it. And there are some fantastic booking agents out there that have a ton of experience. So I don't want yeah. I don't want this to come across like they don't. Uh, or, or you know as an industry in in general because there's some great ones but the other yeah. thing is these guys are getting paid to book you yeah. so they're not going to tell you some things if they're getting you got to watch that and that's one thing yeah. that's so frustrating you know with this industry and and this whole booking agent thing is like they're getting a commission whether they've mm-hmm. been there or not but if you book they're getting paid so of course they're going to try and sell you on the deal. So yeah. I mean I think I think most of the listeners that listen to this podcast are savvy enough to know that you know if they're being sold a bill of goods. Yeah, and the other thing too, and I, this is what I when I'm talking to one of these guys, what I always um, uh, bring up to is uh, I quiz them on like firearm laws or uh, requirements permits. Um, getting the trophy import and export like if you're especially if you're hunting in another country um or even out of uh um like for like in this muskox example i even had to have a permit to get it out of none of it and that's a territory within canada they like you just have to know these things so if you're talking to one of these guys and they don't know what uh permits you're going to need for whether it's for your rifle for your animals uh, that's a bit of a red flag for me that they may not be as experienced as maybe they've led you to believe or whatnot, but it's, they should be pretty knowledgeable in that stuff. And um, I have, have talked to some of these guys that, man, they could tell you uh, the web address to go to, to print off the forms for XYZ permit. And this is a guy you talk to at this airport. And like, so there is some guys that are pretty, pretty knowledgeable, but uh just something to be aware of. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think you make some great points there um, for sure when talking about booking a hunt. Um, and, and I think talking to your outfitter is one thing, but like I think a point you made is talking to your guide is a huge thing. You know, who are you going to actually be with in the field? You know, you, you know whether it's yeah. a week or 10 day or 14 day or 21 day or whatever it is. I mean, like you're yeah. going to have to feel like you have a common bond with this person. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's um, hugely important. Um, let's and, talk about how much to pay. And Okay. So this, uh, this is a pretty interesting topic. So um, what I've found is, and I'm going to keep going back to sheep because sheep are like big money hunts. Um, on like what I've found, especially in like some of these sheep hunts, you'll go on a you'll go on ten different uh, outfitters websites. You'll find ten different prices all over the map. And uh, what I actually did before I did my stone sheep trip was I um, listed out like my top five ten picks for outfitters, the base price, and then I started making columns for all the extras. Like okay, there's a charter flight on this one. There's extra tag fees on this one there's trophy fees on that one and when i laid that all out in a spreadsheet at the end of the day the total all-in cost there really was two price points and the one price point was basic well the and the price points basically um the, the difference between the two hunts was uh um or what made up the difference was trophy quality and logistics to get to the area so the more remote uh the area was it was a bit more expensive and then um, the general trophy quality in the area so um, i know for like stone sheep the central north central part of bc um 
has a little smaller rams than the uh, Rocky Mountain Trench on the eastern side of the province, and the prices kind of reflect that. Um, so there's a lot of, I don't want to say confusion, but there's a lot of ways these outfits can slice and dice their um, their business and their product. So you really got to look at the whole picture when you're before you book the trip and uh, really understand the total all-in cost. But um, typically, though, like if the hunt is, I'm just going to make up a number, say $10,000, you're not going to phone them up and book it for five on a normal day. Um, there are some deals out there, um, but uh, like basically can, um, cancellation um, type hunts, but uh if you, before you put your name on a cancellation list, you should have full intentions of going if you get called and don't just put it on there, kicking the tires and be prepared to drop everything you're doing and go. If you're a guy that can't leave everything on short notice, you know, probably don't even put your name on one of those cancellation lists. Um, I know a lot of my friends that are outfitters, they get kind of frustrated because everybody wants to be on this cancellation list, but none of the, none of them want to actually go on the trip when they get the call. So, um, uh, but, uh, back to how much as well. Sorry, I digressed there. Um, I, I'll just use a, say a black bear trip for an example. If a black bear trip is selling for $4,000, you've looked at 10 outfits and there's one for $2,500 and there's one for $7,000. Well, those are outliers. And you really got to ask yourself, why is this trip so cheap or why is that one so expensive? Um, and it, it could be legitimate reasons. Maybe the one that's that cheap is the guy's brand new to the business, just trying to get a few hunts under his belt, some pictures for his website, and just trying to get things kicked off. And maybe it'll be a great trip. But uh uh, maybe the guy that's charging seven thousand dollars or all that extra money, maybe he's um, got something exceptional there. Like maybe you're staying at a five star lodge and eating filet mignon and drinking wine every night or whatnot. So there might be a reason for it. But typically, if um, an outfitter is asking a price that's outside of what I'm going to call like a general threshold or price for that species, there's definitely some red flags um that should be going up for you when you're looking at that for sure yeah and uh and the the tricky ones though would be some of the sheep uh and other type hunts where you might have extra support staff so um you know some outfits they don't have a whole ton of extra help around like you might not have two or three spotters you might not have a extra wrangler and whatnot so maybe they can um, operate a little cheaper but then another outfit they might have two or three guys employed just spotting non-stop and looking so yeah the trip is going to cost a bit more in that scenario so but uh, I guess the rule of thumb, though, is make sure if you're booking like a full price trip that you are staying within that standard deviation of what the industry is uh, charging. Okay. Um, talk about cancellation and last minute hunts. You, you touched on it before. One thing I can say is mm -hmm. sometimes cancellation hunts, beware guys out there, sometimes cancellation hunts are not cancellation hunts. They pitch them. As cancellation hunts but they're really they couldn't book them and they're trying to use a fancy word to get them booked what, what do you think about that Chris yeah that's absolutely true and they're pretty easy to sniff out the unbooked hunts versus a true cancellation so like a book hunt that they just haven't booked you might save a couple thousand dollars on it as a rule of thumb um, a true cancellation it'll be deeply discounted chances are the guy that booked it lost all of his money and you've got one to two weeks to pack your bags and go on this trip. Um, in the past three, four years, I'm going to say I've seen uh, stone sheep hunts come available last minute for $10,000, which is you would never book that anywhere near that um, on a normal day. So some guy, 
uh, or a gal um, just couldn't go, lost all their money essentially, and and uh, the trip was available for someone else to fill the spot. In, in that um, situation, Chris, you know, let's say it's a thirty thousand dollar hunt, and let's say that yeah. that they've put a fifteen thousand dollar deposit on it, so they have a fifteen thousand dollar, you know, um, yeah. Uh, remaining deposit and it, it comes up cancellation hunt you know thirty thousand dollar hunt um you know it'll cost you fifteen thousand in other words the deposit that's already been made that's gone that person never gets that back yeah but someone's able to step in for the remaining balance in essence to fulfill so the outfitter still gets his same amount of money but yeah. in that case, have you also seen it in those in those numbers of thirty and fifteen? Have you seen it where they offer the cancellation hunt for the fifteen thousand, or have you seen it where they offer it for ten, where it's even more discounted because it's you know um, five days away and you know you have to be there on a plane, like you have to literally get on the plane that day or in you know three days you got to go. Yeah, what I've what I've seen. Or just, and this is just because I know a few outfitters that operate in the Yukon and BC and stuff. Is they'll before they advertise it, they'll call all the guys on their cancellation list and try to sell it for that fifteen. But if uh, if nobody's interested or can go on that's on their list, and they, when they go to advertise it, quite often they'll um, even discount it a little more because it is like you say three to five days, and you have to be here. Um, just so they can get that trip sold because it's pretty hard to book somebody on a 10 day plus trip uh, with a week's notice yeah um, so and that's just the reality of it so if you're a guy that can drop what you're doing get holidays immediately and go it's a, like a great option and and I, I know um, uh, I've had my name on this one cancellation list with a friend of mine and he'll call me almost every year so they're, they're, they come up more often than the average guy thinks. And I think that's um, another reason to be in shape and be ready. You know, if, if you're looking for a stone sheep hunt or you're looking for a doll sheep hunt or, you know, whatever hunt you're looking for that time of year, be ready and be in shape. And, you know, absolutely. like you said earlier, though, don't be on those lists if you're really, truly not in it. If you're really the guy that can drop anything, you know, with a, a day's notice or two days notice, you know, be on those lists if, you know, and there's not a lot of people that can do that either. I mean, no. they, they like to say they can, but the reality is, one, they're probably not in shape, you know, ready to roll. Yeah. They probably don't have, you know, gear that's pretty much ready to just be packed up and, and ready to go. So be yeah. realistic with that and be fair to the outfitter, I would say. Yeah. And uh, like, I know myself, I'm like a hunting nut. So, um, I've got all my gear pretty organized in uh, stuff sacks already. So if I need to walk out the door in an hour, I can have my all the gear I need packed, ready to go. I can be walking out the house almost instantly. Um, so like I'm ready to go if I get a call. But uh, a lot of guys either never think they're going to get a call or if they do get a call, they're almost surprised by it. Yeah, and um, like you say, is just be ready. And uh, the other p thing too, and a lot of guys don't really think about this, but if you um, are dead serious about this cancellation deal, you should actually know who you want to hunt with first. Um, so don't be like uh, putting your name on fifteen outfitters cancellation lists. Figure out if you want to shoot a moose or a stone sheep or whatever. Figure out who you actually want to hunt with for that specific species. Um, and what I've actually done in the past is I'll put a deposit down with those guys. Uh, maybe it's only a th couple thousand dollars. But I'll say, I want to do this trip. I need to do it on a cancellation. I can't afford the full price on it. But I want to be the first guy that gets called when something comes up and here's my deposit. And when you do that, they know you're serious. You got skin in the game at that point. And I could almost guarantee you will get a call. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah. you're, I think you're exactly right. Um, I think your microphone is rubbing up against your shirt or something. Just watch that. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Let's talk about the hunt itself and what to expect as, as a client going on the hunt. 
Yeah, um, for sure. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you should expect, um, but you should already know ahead of time before you show up. Like, um, are you getting picked up at the airport? Do you have to make your own way to camp? Uh, you know, what kind of food's provided? All this stuff. But at a basic level, you should expect to eat well. You should expect to eat often. And you should expect, based on what you're paying, a certain level of service. If you pay almost nothing, you shouldn't expect um, the same kind of level of service as the guy that paid 60000 um, for a trip. Uh, so have realistic expectations on what you're going to get for your money. Um, you should expect, you know, that your tents or your cabins are in good shape. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be staying in a tent that's leaking every time it rains. And, um, you know, if you're using horses or trucks to get out to the hunting area, they should be, you know, good working in good working order, good animals and, you know, broke and ready to ride. Um, you should you you should basically be expecting that you're not going to lose time in your hunt because the outfitters equipment failed. Um, that's why they are outfitters is they are outfitting you with all this gear and that's why you paid them the money or one of the reasons why anyway. Um, the other thing too, and I'll, which I think is absolutely critical or very important is to help your guide out when you can. Um, you know, and if that's like doing dishes or saddling horses or splitting firewood or helping them break down camp or set it up, um, it just, you know, you know, you don't have to do it as a hunter, but when you do that stuff, your chances are your guide's going to work that much harder for you. Um, it's going to give you more time to hunt in the field because he's not having to spend all this time doing camp chores. Um, and you know, the more you help out and try to make things go smooth, it just seems like the hunt just goes out much better. Um, that's what I've found anyways. And like these, some, a lot of these seasoned guides, you know, say for saddling horses, a lot of them, they don't even want you to, to get in their way doing that because you're just in the way and it's actually going to be longer if you try to quote help. But uh, there is a lot of other stuff you can help out with the, around camp, and um, it just makes, you know, just makes it that much better, in my opinion. Um, yeah, uh, another thing you should really know, too, is, like, how much hiking and walking you're going to do. Like, if, uh, like you say, some of these guys show up on these trips, they're so out of shape, they couldn't walk down a city street, let alone climb a mountain. Um so you really need to know how much hiking to expect, especially if you're um, questioning how in shape you are. And, um, you know, if the guide tells you you're going to be walking X number of miles a day, you should, you know, expect that and be ready for it. But uh, like you said, that all goes back to being ready for these trips before you even go on them. Like once you're there, it's too late. So, um yeah, uh, the other thing too with kind of like what to expect and what to do on a hunt is take pictures and take as many of them as you possibly can. Um, like on a typical week, if I'm out on a hunt, I'll take at least two to 300 pictures. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when you get home, you don't just have a handful of trophy shots or like, you know, hero shots. Grip and grins. Yeah, exactly. You've got like your whole experience documented. And um, I've always found that when I've gone through my pictures at the end of the trip, I was like, oh, wow, this is really neat. I forgot I took that picture. And oh, wow, this is One, one great. thing I can add to that, Chris, to help people out, because I'm a big picture taker too. And my yeah. hunting partner, Dar, is not so much. Um, mm -hmm. He just doesn't, you know, just doesn't really make that a priority he just never yeah. has um and you know it, it a lot of it has to do with you know my personality his personality you know his desire to have pictures or not have pictures but one thing i can tell you to kind of get in the routine of is every time you stop and glass take a few pictures every time it, yeah. you stop to take your pack off to you know whatever if you have to you know stop and you know you know re-cinch something down 
take a few pictures you know if you stop to to rest just whip out your camera take a few pictures and if you can kind of get in the habit of every time you kind of come to a stop and get a picture or two or a, you know a 10 15 30 second video clip of whatever by the time the hunt is over with you actually have really good documentation of your hunt and i've had people ask me before like you know how do you take more pictures and and if you can get disciplined about every glassing point you stop at take a few yeah. pictures when you start take a few pictures before you put your stuff away then you pack up you walk up the ridge you get to another rock outcropping take a few pictures before you even start glassing take a few pictures before you throw your pack on and by the end of the hunt i mean you will have an unbelievable um you know uh, gallery of photos yeah yeah exactly and um like you know a lot of these trips are hunt of a lifetimes like you're probably not doing the trip twice in a lot of cases especially if it's a expensive trip like a sheep hunt or um some of these other ones so you know you're not going to regret especially in this day and age with digital photography taking more pictures than not and um you know you can't go back and do it take them twice you know you can't go back and take pictures from yesterday so uh just like you say um be disciplined about it and what i found really helps too is um, a lot of the guys will put their cameras in their backpack but i always keep mine where it's handy and in a jacket pocket or um, somewhere where i can easily get to it where i'm not digging around my gear for it and i found that really makes a big difference too for um taking extra shots so for sure. Um, let's talk about guided hunt etiquette. Yeah. So this is a this is um, a part that I want to talk about too, based on a lot of my conversations with some of my friends that are guides and wranglers. And um, you know, if you just think about your personal life, if you treat people like garbage, they're probably not going to like you, and they're not going to go out of their way for you. But if you treat them well with respect uh you know treat them like a human being um they're gonna go out of their way for you and it's a guide is no different just because you've paid to be on the trip doesn't mean that you shouldn't treat that person with a lot of respect um so what you're a multimillionaire, and that guide's making twenty five thousand a year like you're a person just like he is um you know treat them well and a trip will guarantee will go a lot smoother. Um, you know, and then on any paid hunting trip, you can sit back and put your feet up and let the guide and support staff wait on your hand of hand and foot. But uh, like I was mentioning before, when you start pitching in um, around camp, like say you made a kill that day, you get back to camp quite late. Well, the guide may be, needs to tend the horses and do a few other things well maybe you can go and start getting uh dinner that night ready and you know get the campfire going or the stove going or do things to help out um you know your guide will appreciate those extra little things that you're doing for them um and you know and when it comes down to it they're going to try a lot harder to get you something than a guy that uh, might just be putting his feet up and kind of ordering you around camp. So, um, or ordering the guide around. And that brings me to kind of to my next point is like these guides are, they're your guide and you paid for the trip and they're working for you, but they're not your slave. Um, you know, if you need, uh, something or have suggestions what you might want to do to the hunt you know let them know that and whatnot but don't be barking orders don't tell them we're going here today and we're doing this now and we're, don't um, guide the know. guide exactly let the guide do his job the guide is the leader on that trip there's a reason you hired them if uh, you knew better than the guide you'd be doing it yourself so um you know that's that's probably a big uh, big thing like i know uh I've talked to a couple guys that have never gone on a guided trip, but they're thinking about it and they're just, uh, in their mind, um, they're almost like going to Africa where they got 15 people waiting on them hand and foot and whatnot. And I say, well, it's 
not like that at all. And if you do make it like that, you're not going to have a good time, probably. You know, um, I get quite a few direct messages on Instagram and emails and such, and Mm. I get some quite often. I get this, um, you know, how come you don't have more DIY guys on? How come you have a lot of guides and a lot of outfitters? And my general response to them is most guides and most outfitters that I know are very, very good hunters. Most yeah. of the best hunters that I know are guides. And oh, absolutely. So, you know, to, if anybody's listening out there and wondering why I have a lot of people on that are guides is because they typically spend more time out in the field than the general DIY guy. Nothing wrong with the DIY guy. But for me, as a podcast host, it's kind of hard to find guys that are DIY guys that spend more time than the guides. And so, yeah. um, you know, that, that that's a point there that I think needs to be made that, you know, it, granted, there are situations where there's new guides or inexperienced guides, but mm-hmm. most guides that have done it for a while are very good at their, you know, whatever hunt you're on with them, most guides are pretty good at it. So I would say respect them. It doesn't matter if, you know, you make 40 times more than the, than they do. Mm-hmm. In that particular application, they are better at it in most cases than you are. So learn from them. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, you just got to think about it as if you were looking at yourself and your own job at the office or um, if you're a tradesman at your trade Um you know, you're honed in on your craft and you are good at your craft and you are working at your craft to be the best that you can be. And it's no different than these guides. They, their job is to be a guide and to hunt and their job is hunting and they hunt exponentially more than the average guy, like hands down and they hone their craft. They know their animals. They know the spots. They know how to glass um, and you know, and like I say, when I say they know how to glass, glassing is more than just throwing your binoculars up and scanning across the mountainside. Like it's, um, it is an acquired skill and a lot of, uh, people that don't do a lot of hunting don't understand that. Um, but I can guarantee you that your guide is a far superior hunter than you are in 99% of the 99% of the time for whatever species you're going with them for. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, let's let's talk about tipping. Um, I know I get asked a lot uh, about what yeah. what is, you know, proportionate tips. Um, curious your take on that. Mm-hmm. So, I uh, that's funny. I get asked this question. This is probably the number one question um, people ask me if they're going on their uh, trip for the first time. And um, I tell them, like, on a smaller trip, like, 10% is a good rule of thumb. So, like, you know, if you're doing a uh, $3,000 uh, bear hunt or uh, something to that effect, maybe a $300, like, 10% is $300. That, that might be a fairly reasonable tip. Um, you know, obviously, plus or minus, depending on the level of service or whatnot um i know on some group trips like uh, caribou for instance um a group of like say eight guys might go in and all eight of you may only give a hundred dollars but you only might have one guide in that case but the total tip is kind of proportionate to what the trip is um but on a bigger trip like say a sheep hunt um Man, I've heard of everything from, you know, gear to a couple thousand dollars. And, you know, I, I'm not sure what guys have tipped you for sheep hunts, but, um, you know, it really seems to increase or decrease depending on the the um, prestige of the, the species you're hunting is what I've found. Um, what what one, yeah, sorry, one thing I would say is when I get asked the question, I say, well, okay, what would be any different than going on a guided hunt than say going to a restaurant? When you go to a restaurant, yeah. a normal tip is fifteen percent, a normal tip, mm-hmm. and so I tell people, 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna differ with you just a little bit. Yeah. Um. And it, and it, it that's the thing. It's all across the board. But what I tell people, and obviously I'm an outfitter, so you know I'm gonna yep. I'm not gonna say five percent. Normally I say fifteen percent, and I've seen as high as you know thirty, forty, fifty percent tips as well. And I I oh, I, yeah. I think it just depends on how well you hit it off with your hunter, uh, how well the guide is actually working. You know, I've seen mm-hmm. hunters that are extremely happy with the way everything went down, and they give a very, very generous tip. I would say yeah. you have to kind of play off the situation of how did it go, and, yeah. you know, do you want to come back and hunt? And if you want to come back and hunt, and know that most guides and most outfitters, I mean, every little penny counts. So if you give them a, yeah. you know, 18% tip, or you give them a 20% tip and, you know, you may come back for one of those other species, they're going to be yeah. tickled pink. So, you know, keep that yeah. in mind, too, that, you know, I try and treat people fairly and, and treat them right. Um, and I don't think it should be any different in your tipping. You should, you know, if if, yeah. if you've got kind of a, 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 you know, not as good a service or just kind of a standard service, then maybe 10% is fair. But if you've got someone that's really, really working hard and, you know, really done a good job, personally, I don't see how it's any different than going to a restaurant where 15%, at least in the United States, I don't know how it is yeah. in Canada, 15% is like that. that's the normal, that's what someone tips. And, you know, if someone yeah. was at a restaurant and got less than a 15% tip, then they obviously know that either the person was cheap because that's against the norm yeah. or that they did something wrong. Yeah, and um, the other thing I'll bring up with that too is um, – it really can depend on the person, like the hunter's economic situation too. So, you know, save a sheep hunt. There's some guys that can write that check every year, uh, go all day long. They don't even notice the money's gone. And like, you're absolutely right. They, they can afford to tip quite well. And um, I know there is some guys that, uh, like a, a, one example I just can think of off the top of my hand, my friend who's the guide was telling me about this. It was a school teacher from, uh, I think it was like Mississippi or one of those states anyway. So never really made a lot of money, saved up his entire life to do this moose hunt in the Yukon. And uh, so he went up there, they got a great moose. He was tickled pink, very appreciative. And at the end of it, he was kind of embarrassed because he didn't really have a tip or anything of significance for the guide. Um, But my friend who was the guide, you know, he's like, you know, I no worries. Like I appreciate that what situation you're in and, and, uh, it is what it is. Right. But, um, like I would say if you can afford it, um, which most people do in some of these bigger trips typically can, um, give a proper tip to reflect the level of service, especially when these guys have gone out of their way for you. Um, it got like, like I've had peop I've had, um, on a couple of trips I've had it where, You know, we got back from a long, hard day of hunting and the camp cook has the fire in your tent lit. And um, first thing in the morning, uh, before you're out of bed, they're back in there. They got the fire lit so it's warm when you get out. And like, you know, to me, that's going above and beyond. And, um, you know, so those people, like you say, every little bit helps. And if you can afford it, tip them properly and treat them well and, you, you know, you, chances are you'll have lifelong friends out of them too. Yeah, for sure. You know, one thing you touched on a little bit at the beginning of the episode or the podcast was um, the boots that have worked for you. One question I would have yep. with your mountain hunting, um, you know, what what gear, you know, and this is probably a whole nother podcast, but, you know, yep. what are you running as far as gear from head to toe um, and what have you found works best for you? Okay, so um, I'm not one of these guys that'll get like a specific brand and be totally outfitted with it. I'll get the very specific things that I like that I think are exceptional from each each uh, of these brands or companies or whatever that works for me specifically. So uh, like I'd mentioned earlier, my boots are hand wags. And if I ever had to buy a or next time I have to buy a pair of boots, I'll 
definitely get the exact same ones, just they work for me, they're perfect for me, and uh, no issues. So I'll get those again. Um, for a jacket, um, the, I've, I've got the Kuyu guide jacket. And to give you an idea of how long ago I've got this jacket, I got it when it was they were still made in Canada. So it's actually got a made in Canada uh, label on it which is like and 2010 like one of the first generations ex- exactly and i love that jacket i wear it ev- all, virtually every trip i wear it um and you know for how thin those jackets are they are exceptionally warm i have no idea why but like i i'm wearing that guy jacket in november moose hunts in canada when it's snowing outside and i'm not having an issue staying warm so absolutely love that jacket. Um, they're not advertised as waterproof, but they are some, somewhat water repellent to a point. Um, so that's definitely, I don't go anywhere without that jacket. Um, uh, then under that jacket, like if I'm hunting in later season up here, I'll have like a wool sweater and then uh, like a, some kind of a base layer with some merino wool or um, some kind of a zip up long underwear shirt or something to that effect and then always 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 i will have hiking pants and if it's cold enough i'll have um like a polar tech long underwear something like that underneath them but um i used to hunt in jeans all the time and uh, alberta is fairly dry in the fall so i never really had an issue but when i went to alaska man i was soaked right away with jeans and but when you're wearing the hiking pants and uh some of these other synthetics like wick moisture you can actually get dry fairly quickly even if it is damp outside so um even like when i went up to uh, none of it for this muskox you know it's 35 below out all i wore for pants was my hiking pants that i would have on a sheep trip and a pair of long underwear underneath it and uh, obviously i had like some uh ski pants on top of that but just keeping dry at that base layer is so critical and uh after i got that kind of figured out man it sure made a world of difference being comfortable um and then the other thing too that often gets overlooked is socks um i basically only wear these uh, smart wool socks now they're i think they're uh i want to say marina wool and i think probably some kind of synthetic blend but um, I've never had an issue wearing them. They wick moisture away from your feet. Um, they just really work well for me anyways. Uh, the last thing you never want to wear, in my opinion, is cotton. If you can stay away from cotton when you're on these backpack trips, uh, don't even bring it because you won't get it dried out. Um, but that would kind of be my biggest piece of advice is just avoid cotton like the plague. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, we've got some other things on our yeah. outline here, but yeah. uh, I'm going to tell you the green drakes are starting to hatch here in the Roaring Fork Valley, and I've got an mm-hmm. uh, appointment on the river tonight, so I'm going to have to run. But um, okay. uh, talk about uh, post-hunt, what you need to do as a hunter. So there's a, bu- there's a bunch of stuff, um, like, and I'm assuming after you already got home and, you know, your travels are done. Um, you know, you're going to want to take some time to digest the trip that you just been on. And what I mean by that is, you know, think about what went well, what didn't, um, what might you've done differently next time or what you could have done better, you know, what you liked about the outfit, what you didn't. Um, cause I'll tell you one thing when I did my first trip, that one to Alaska, I thought I knew exactly what I wanted. I thought I wanted this you know, super rugged DIY style backpack hunt where we're live, you know, living day to day out of our packs and, you know, suffering kind of for the sake of the hunt almost. And then after I did it, I was like, you know, this trip would have been a whole lot better if it was just a wee bit more comfortable. So, um, you know, after you do a trip or two, you'll really hone in on what you're looking to get out of a hunt, like a guided hunt specifically. And, what you want for comfort and, um, you know, maybe packing that extra pound or two for a better tent will make all the difference in the world. Maybe, um, 
or a sleeping bag or whatever the case may be. Um, but you know, once you get home, uh, average guy should really de- debrief yourself, I guess, really, and um, kind of understand why things went the way they did, whether they were whether they went successful or not successful, just really understand what um, contributed to that. And then the next time you go to do a trip, even if it's a DIY trip, um, you know, you can kind of put that knowledge towards the next hunt you do. Yeah. And I think you got to self-evaluate. I mean, I think you got to look at where, where maybe on, on your end, you weren't ready or things that you did wrong or things that you would do different to make yourself better on the next opportunity and you know be a little bit self-aware of of your weaknesses and where you could you know increase your strengths for the next opportunity um i think it's huge and you know i think self-evaluation is 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 a huge factor that i think a lot of people you know they can blame everything else but very rarely do they take a look at maybe where they could have done a better job Um, yeah exactly and and And, i think that's what makes great hunters is people that you know are are willing to laugh at themselves a little bit and willing to be hard on themselves when maybe they didn't prepare correctly or maybe they didn't bring the right gear um and didn't take it as serious and i think if you can get more like that you can become a more efficient machine you know when you're going on these hunts yeah exactly and i think like one of the biggest uh shortcomings a lot of um adventure hunters have is um especially first time adventure hunters is they think they're in better shape than they actually are and i like i'm guilty of it myself um like i try to go out at lunch, noon every day like cuz I, I i live a pretty sedentary lifestyle working monday to friday in an office so i try to get out at noon every day and go for a walk for a half hour an hour just kind of get moving and do a lot of stuff on the weekends and you know, I've fooled myself on a, one or two occasions where I thought, you know, I'm actually not in too bad a shape here. And then you get out to the mountain and you're like, man, I, what was I thinking? I was in nowhere near um, the kind of condition I should be in. Yeah. And, uh, and it's really easy to fool yourself into thinking you are in better shape, especially if you're not overweight and, you know, if you're a naturally lean guy, um, you, it's really easy to talk yourself into thinking that you're in quite good shape. And uh, I'm sure you've seen that with a lot of clients too. They'll show up and, you know, you're going for a sheep or a mule deer or whatever, and you're hiking out and they get turned back and they're sitting there panting. And, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just yeah, no fun I mean, for anybody when I've, you're out of shape. I've yeah. been... I've been on those hunts and I've also been where I, I wasn't in the condition that I needed to be in. So I've seen both sides of the, you know, being realistic, I've seen both sides of that, that story. And I just think people need to be more self-aware with, with, you know, what they've got going on and be honest with themselves. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. We, we have more on our outline here, but, um, I want to thank you for your time and congratulate you on the success that you've had and look forward to the day, uh, you know, when you get uh, drawn in one of these states for uh, your desert so you can complete your Grand Slam. I think that'll be an awesome accomplishment. Uh, Yeah, it'll be great. I want to thank you for your time. I also want to thank the sponsors of this podcast, uh, GoHunt.com, Insider. Uh, if you use the J. Scott promo code, you're going to get a $50 store credit to the new Go Hunt gear shop. Uh, use the J. Scott promo code for that. Uh, the uh, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, I want to remind uh, the listeners out there that the Kuyu World Tour, uh, the mobile showroom, is going to be in, um, let's see here, uh, June 20, let's see, starting... June 29th, uh, Boise, Idaho through July 1st, then Idaho Falls, Bozeman, Montana, July 13th through the 15th, Denver, Colorado, July 20th through the 22nd, Colorado Springs, Omaha, Nebraska, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, You can go on Kuyu.com and find out where that mobile showroom is going to be. Every size, every piece of gear that Kuyu makes will be at the mobile showroom. You can try it on. You can feel it. Um, and, and 
that the overwhelming response from Kuyu customers out there is 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 just been awesome uh, with with people getting to actually you know feel it before they uh, try it on know exactly what size and what have you it's been phenomenal uh, also the outdoorsman's in Phoenix Cody Nelson and his crew if you use the J Scott promo code you're going to get a 10% discount and phonescope.com uh, if you use the J Scott promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount there when you purchase um, any any product there at PhoneScope. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you for your time, and um, yeah, it's just been awesome. We've covered a lot of ground, and uh, yep. keep up the good work with your job, and uh, look forward to the next uh, hunt. And I want to let uh, people know. I want you to let people know how they can follow you or how they can get a hold of you or, or, or what have you on social media or whatnot. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm on Facebook. Just uh, if you Google Chris Maxwell and uh, I think there's a couple of us, but I'm the guy with the sheep on the profile. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Rocky underscore uh, mountain underscore Ram underscore Hunter. So Rocky mountain Ram Hunter with the underscores in between the words. And I post a few videos and some pictures on there um uh mostly all hunting related type stuff and uh, i think i even posted a little picture of a muskox video i took when i was up north there this spring it's kind of neat to see the herds there so um and then i also uh, write a little column for a magazine called big game illustrated and uh i think it's published here for, uh, quarterly so you can uh, check out some of my stuff on there if you like that's awesome. Well, thanks for spending time with us, and thanks to the listeners for all uh, your loyal support here of this podcast. Uh, I'm going to go try and uh, drown some uh, green drakes and see if see if I can catch some fish tonight. Um, here in the Roaring Fork Valley, it's um, the, the rivers have finally just cleared, and um, the drakes are kind of hatching that last 30 minutes of light. So um, I'm I'm off uh, going to go fish with my buddy Eldeen. Uh, tonight and uh gonna have a good time so thanks everybody for listening thanks chris for your time and until next time god bless